This video is brought to you by YT Andrew Paul Tech Repairs. If you have a console, laptop, computer or Macbook in need of repair in the UK or the EU then have a look in the description below this video for details on how to contact us in order to organise your repair. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to today's video and today we've got something uh, completely new for this channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at a Nintendo Switch with no power, completely dead, bricked, whatever you like. Um, this is a HAC CPU 10 uh, motherboard and today we're going to be diagnosing the fault with it. Um, so as a disclaimer, uh, this came in uh, last week. I've been uh, taking a look at it. I found the problem with it, um, so we'll go over that on the video, how we did that, and what the problem with this board is, and then we'll get to fixing it. So, um, yes, <laughs> my apologies today if I seem a little bit um, out of it. Um, this is being recorded on the 13th of uh, December, which is a Friday, Friday the 13th, it's always good. Uh, and last night, for those of you who don't live in the UK, you might not know, uh, we actually had a, a general election last night, um, which is like where we elect uh, our government and our MPs to sit in the Houses of Parliament. And um, I'm, I'm a bit of a politics buff, so I stayed up all night last night to watch it. And uh, <laughs> so I'm paying for it today. I'm absolutely knackered, but uh, we'll, we'll get through this. Uh, OK, so with that said... Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this board and see what the problem is. Now this has been sent up from a uh, another business. This is another repair shop that sent this up for repair. Uh, I don't know if they've done any work on it themselves. However, the board has had some previous signs of work uh, done on it, and we'll take a look at that and we'll just so we'll see what they've they've been doing. But obviously, um, this has been looked at before, and uh, yeah, there's one or two little bits on it that aren't particularly brilliant so let's just take a look and see so essentially what happens is when you plug this into uh, a charger uh, it does nothing at all there's no lights no nothing on the screen no activity doesn't turn on doesn't do a damn thing uh, it's just essentially a paperweight at the moment and this is a really common issue on these machines and there isn't sort of one particular cause there's two or three really common ones uh, that you should check in this in this scenario and we'll go over what those are right now. So if you have a look over here, okay, we have this. This is where the board designation is. It's right at the bottom here. Underneath here, of course, you have the RAM and the CPU. These, of course, run on an NVIDIA uh, Tegra chipset. So they're effectively a glorified tablet computer with a with a, a what they call it, an, an, an eye for gaming, shall we say? Um, so what happens is, is like I said, this particular machine. Is completely dead. If you plug a charged battery into it, it's completely dead. It doesn't do anything at all. So we know it's not the battery, because if you plug a good battery in, it's still dead. Uh, regardless as to whether you have it on the charger or not, it's dead and doesn't do anything. So that tells us that we have a problem on this board here. So, well, how the hell do you even start to troubleshoot something like that? Well, let's go over some of the common causes of this particular issue. Now, if we take a look, as I say, this is at the bottom uh, of the board so we have the USB-C charging port there that is a little bugger this USB-C port here is the bane of many many repair technicians life and existence because it's a load of old pony it breaks all the bloody time so <laughs> and they're not the easiest thing to replace either and I'll tell you for why because you can see here there's a, a row of pins along the back here OK, that row of pins there along the back is absolutely fine. You're thinking, OK, well, what's the problem with that? Well, nothing. But of course, USB-C is universal. So you can in, you can insert the lead either way up. You can insert it right way up or upside down. It's the same. It's just um, it's just a, an oval shape, isn't it? A rectangle with rounded corners, whatever you'd rather call it. Um, and essentially, that means that there are two sets of pins that uh, sit opposite. So consequently, if you plug it in upside down, it doesn't matter uh, but that does mean there's a second row of pins now you can only see one of them that's because the second set is under here right under the shield and you can't take it off and you can't take it apart so how the hell do you solder it well the next time I have one to do I'll show you okay it's not actually as difficult as you think once you've done a few of them 
it's easy peasy. There's a couple of tricks in, to it. The, unfortunately, the last couple of times I've done one of these, uh, I've not had the opportunity to film it, unfortunately, because it's just been sort of like time. Either I've not had time to do it and it's had to go out quickly or it's not been one that's had to go out really quickly, but I've just not had time to film it because I've just had so much work on to do. Um, so unfortunately, I've not had a chance to get one on camera yet, but I'm sure I'll get one. And when I do, I'll get it on camera for you and we'll show you what to do. But uh, yes, as I was saying, uh, this commonly breaks. And of course, if you've got a broken charge port, it stands to reason you can't charge it. Now, again, it's a very similar sort of thing to what you would do um, with a PS4 HDMI port or an Xbox One HDMI port. I.e., the first thing you should do is look down the barrel of it and see if it's broken. So I don't know how well this is going to come across on camera because obviously it's underneath the microscope. But we'll see if we can get a shot underneath it. I don't think it's going to work. To be honest, it might. It might do possibly eh, not very well actually. I don't think it's going to work very well at all. Nah, it's too close. It's too close, unless I can hold it further away. Oh, there we go. Okay, so as you can see there, we can see down the back of the barrel there, there's just the ground shield. There's no sort of pins or anything sticking up or out. Uh, the comb itself, as we can see there in the centre, is nice and straight. There's no breaks, no fractures, nothing. There's nothing sticking up or out of it. It's all looking really nice. So there's no break at all there. So that's good. I'll just get this back in focus for you. Oh god, what have I done there? Oh shit. <laughs> Come back. Come back to me. No. <laughs> Oh, do you know, I'll tell you what it is. The lead, the power lead on my uh, HDMI camera has a break in the wire. And sometimes if you pull it at the wrong angle, it fucking turns off. <sighs> right, hang on a minute. Bear with me. Hopefully that should uh, come back. Hopefully. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. But yes, as we can see there, everything looks absolutely okay, not a problem. Um, so that all looks absolutely fine. So we'll go back to where we where we started off. So there's a board designation there at the bottom. So the right-hand side of that is the USB-C port. As I say, this looks okay on this particular machine, so not too bothered. So the right-hand side of that, a little bit further over, is here. And you can see what I mean by there's been some... Uh, yes, there has been some work done to this board uh, previously, and uh, we'll go over that. Now then, unfortunately, I don't have any donor boards for these machines at the moment, so yes. If there's anything missing on here, it could be interesting. Uh, so we can see here, this is the battery connector right over here on the right-hand side. Uh, that's the speaker connector, I do believe, if I remember rightly. Uh, we have a little flat FPC connector here. These things uh, sit incredibly closely to this. This is a BQ24193. This is a charge controller IC. Uh, it basically takes charge of uh, charging the battery. Okay, so if your battery is not charging, then generally speaking, probably going to be this. Now, as we can see, somebody has tried to reflow this at some point. Uh, there is some solder work. In fact, when like I say, I've been through this and I've troubleshooted it. We'll go over it. Uh, but yeah, you can see here, look, um, there's some solder on the back side of this cap, which looks like this has been off at some point. There's a cap missing here and a couple of pads that are toasted. That's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some flux residue and stuff around there. This has been off. There's a tiny break to the corner of that IC there. It doesn't look too bad to be honest with you i don't think it's detrimental to the way it's going to work it should be okay providing this ic is good i think it's a bit of crap on it there so yeah um this cap here i'm honestly not sure what the hell it does but the fact it's missing isn't particularly great <laughs> um, it looks like actually it sits across these two uh, planes here. I'm not entirely sure. Is one of them ground? It may just be a big smoothing cap. Let's just take a look and see. 
You have the multimeter in continuity mode. And that's ground. That obviously isn't. This is connected to this side here. So this is probably a smoothing capacitor uh, for... This will either be input... This will probably be input to the chip. So power supply in... I would guess. I don't know. I don't have the schematics. Like I said, I've not done work on many of these. I'm purely guessing. I don't have a good machine to test it against. I don't have any sort of donor boss to test it against. Uh, this is probably the first sort of... Um, what's the word? No power one I've personally looked at. I d like I said, I don't do many work. I don't do work on switches, um, really. That's not because I don't do them. I do. You can see here I do. And I've done the charge ports and things like that before now. Uh, I just don't get the call for anybody. Nobody asked me to, to fix them. So consequently, I've never looked at them. <laughs> but hopefully that's going to change because I really like these machines. And if you've got a broken one, feel free to hit me up and we'll see what we can do. So anyway, yes, so this is a charge controller IC. For the battery, uh, if this goes out, your battery won't charge. Possibly, if it's shorted, it may bring down uh, power to the machine and cause a no power scenario. Now, how is that? Well, let's take a look and see if we have anything around here which gives us a clue that this may be a problem. So, what we have here, like I said, this charge controller I see is a potential issue. If we go back around to the left, where the USB charging and docking port is there, okay, if we go up from there, there's a couple of FETs and things there. Okay, you can see this thing here. This is an MT, sorry, an M92T36. This is a Type-C USB power delivery controller. It's utilizing the USB power delivery specification 2.0 across that Type-C connector. And essentially it's working in combination with the Tegra's power management on the SOC and that BQ charging controller up there by the battery to provide charge power to the console and to help charge the battery. So if this goes bad, of course, you may get no power to your Nintendo Switch. Stands to reason that, therefore, could be the problem. And the third thing, which sometimes goes on these as one of the more common things, is this little thing here. This is a PI3 USB 30532ZLE. This is a quite fancy little thing, really. So, essentially what this does is it puts out uh, eDisplay port 1.2 across USB 3.0. Yeah, so if you look here, look, we can see some very, very uh, striking similarities to a HDMI encoder IC uh, circuit on a, um, on a PS4, actually. This is more very similar sort of thing to a, a V-Time, a V-Driver on Xbox One uh, S and an X as well. But you'll sort of, when you look at the layout of the circuit, you'll see what I mean by it looks very similar to a PS4 circuit. And by that, I mean we have the IC here. Okay, then we have these little EMI filters here. These are noise suppression, things like that. And then it goes across these filters out through the USB-C port where it provides eDisplay port, uh, which then obviously when you dock it onto your switch dock, which should connect to your TV, it switches the video. It's, no, it's an AV switch essentially. So it switches the video from the internal display, supports uh e-display port 1.2 out of your USB-C port, that goes into your docking station, your docking station then connects to your TV, and the uh, the video output goes from your switch to your shiny HDTV that you have it plugged into via HDMI. So yes, when that chip goes bad and it shorts, guess what? It can also take power out uh, to your console, and of course, because it's very similar in uh, layout and design to uh, that PS4 circuit, and we know just how troublesome those HDMI encoder ICs can be. Yep, this thing here is just as susceptible to failing, and when it does, it has the potential to take out power to your console, which is really shit, because at least on the PS4, that doesn't really happen. You know, the thing will still turn on, it just doesn't show you anything. At least with this thing, it kills the machine, so that's, 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 that's great, isn't it? Anyway... So let's get back up to our charge controller IC we were taking a look at. So this is most likely a smoothing capacitor. Uh, we probably can get away with that missing, but we'll see. As I say, I don't have any replacements, any spares to replace that with. I um, am actually on the lookout for some scrap switchboards. I'll see what I can do. I've, I've no doubt I'll be able to get a couple from, from my usual places, uh, and then that won't be a problem. So if you're watching this uh, on YouTube... 
now I've probably managed to source some, so that's that's good. Anyway, um, so yes, this little IC here. How the hell can we tell if this potentially is causing our no power problem? Well, the good thing is, is that there's a really simple way of doing it. And that really simple way of doing it is to get a digital multimeter, stick it in continuity mode. And continuity mode is the mode where when you get the two multimeter probes together, they beep. OK, so that tells you. Hello, that tells you um, my multimeter is being a bugger. There we go. Yes, that's it. OK, it's happy again. So, um, yes, essentially um, what happens here is when you touch these two pins together on the multimeter. Essentially, that tells you that there is a direct connection between the first point, i.e. the black probe here. So there's a direct connection from there to the red probe there. OK, so if we have continuity across some of these things here, these are capacitors. OK, now what's the significance of these things in these circuits? Well, a lot of these little ICs here are what they call, well, they're all integrated circuits. They're IC chips. OK, now, of course, way back when. Uh, all these little IC chips didn't really exist. Um, you'd have sort of a chip with the programming on it. You'd have loads of diodes um, and everything else. And essentially all those little bits and pieces would go together to create a circuit to get a machine to behave in a certain way. And of course, over time with technology and everything else, uh, those little, uh, those massive circuits were all condensed and they were all internalized into a nice, neat little package like this one. There was no need for all those extra components and all those individual bits and pieces. The circuit board design could be simplified. They were smaller, they were cheaper to produce, etc. etc. And of course, you can get a lot more functionality in that little footprint there. If that had to go. Uh, you know, back in the sort of, you know, 80s, 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s, sort of, this would be massive. There'd be no way you could fit this in a little tiny handheld device. So these IC chips here are brilliant when they work. When they don't, unfortunately, because they have so much functionality packed into that one IC, if that IC fails, it can take out all sorts of different other things and it can create loads of really weird random patterns of behavior and that's why sort of modern electronics can be a bit of a pain sometimes anyway of course what happens here is this little ic will have lots of little different inputs from other various parts of the circuit it'll have power ground it'll have signals to and from probably the pmic uh, from uh, likely the central processor, the Tegra chip, all that sort of other good stuff here. And it'll communicate back and forth left, you know, to actually be able to do its job. And it will control other various things, principally the charging of the battery that goes into this connector here. OK, now in order to do that, as I say, it's going to take power inputs and it's going to offer power output in order to charge this battery. OK. Now, what happens is, is of course, this is a little IC chip. It's a computer, essentially, within a computer. And one thing that computers don't like is lots of noise. They don't like noise. They like a nice, constant, steady voltage. They don't like any noise. And essentially what that enables them to do is work perfectly in sync with everything else. If you start into introducing noise, and by noise, what I mean is, essentially is ripples on the voltage rails that come in and go out. So what happens is, is without these caps here, you would get bits of noise. So if you looked at it on an oscilloscope, you'd see little spikes. OK, and what that is, is the voltage ever so slightly fluctuating up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That really will play havoc with these things. They don't like it. OK, so what do manufacturers do? Well, <clears throat> they put these little capacitors in. OK, and what they do is... <clears throat> excuse me, what these little capacitors do is they put one side on ground and they put the other side on the voltage rail. OK, and what happens then is it allows that uh, what essentially happens is, is the voltage that's either going in or coming out gets stored up in this capacitor. OK, and because it's stored and it has this little path to ground here, what it actually does is those little spikes, because it's stored up and it comes out the other side, it comes out really smoothly, really flat. OK, the other side is just to complete the circuit 
Um, so essentially what happens is it takes those little spikes, those little bits of up and down, up and down, which might cause havoc, and it just smooths them completely flat. Okay, so it has no noise, it's allowed to do what it needs to do, it's important for timing and everything else. Beautiful, that's what happens, okay? But what happens is, is if this chip fails and it shorts to ground on one of these power rails that these caps are connected to, what happens is obviously one side is connected to ground, but then this the power rail side where it's shorted will then also go to ground. And this capacitor, rather than being a capacitor and storing charge to remove the noise, actually just acts as a big wire. And of course, because power and voltage looks for the shortest path to ground, it's a, it's a lazy bugger, okay? Power is a lazy sod, okay? What happens is, is it looks for the shortest path to ground. It will do anything to get there, okay? It is the most work-shy freeloading little git you can think of, okay? This is like sending it around an army obstacle course and it's spotting a gap in the fence and going, I don't have to go all the way over that nasty obstacle course. There's a gap in the fence here. There's nobody watching. I can just sneak through that gap and go straight to the finish line. And that's essentially what happens when you've got a short on that circuit, rather than it having to go through all the obstacles and jumping through all the transistors and everything else and the, and the diodes and the resistors to get to the end of the obstacle course where we eventually let it go to ground when it's done what we want it to do, it goes, no, bugger off, I'm not doing that. I've just got to go to ground because I can. Okay. Now, that's a problem because obviously that means that our circuit isn't completed and consequently things don't work properly but what it does mean when we're looking for shorts and issues with these ICs is that we can see that both sides of one of these capacitors is going to be connected to ground okay so that shows us that we have a short on that rail and if we have a short on a power rail guess what we're not going to get any power or something's not going to be working properly okay now in our instance it's a power rail issue. So we have our multimeter in continuity mode. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're just going to probe around some of these uh, capacitors here to see if we have continuity across any of them. Okay, and if we do, we know we've potentially got a problem. So what happens here is if we take this here, we have multimeter probes on both sides of the capacitor. The multimeter at the moment is reading open line OL. OK, so multimeters will show that as a one. Uh, essentially, it's infinite resistance. It basically means there is absolutely no sort of interaction across that capacitor. Now, that in continuity mode is perfectly acceptable. That's what we'd, ex we'd expect. We wouldn't expect uh, there to be any sort of measurable resistance on there. It should be a while open line, and it is. OK, sometimes you'll see um, the count on your multimeter going up because it's taken a charge from the uh, from the leads on the multimeter. But essentially speaking, there shouldn't be any resistance measured across that. It should just say, oh, well, open line. OK, so we'll just check some of these other ones around here. That's still OL. What about this one here? That one's OL. This big one. OK, OL. I think we've checked these smaller ones, but... OK... Nothing there. Nothing there. Just checking these again, just to make sure. Well, there's no capacitor here, but we'll just check the footprint across. So there's no pad here, but it is connected to this side of the IC. So let's just see what we have. If I can get my uh, finger out of the way. Yeah. So there's nothing there. There's no interaction with ground there at all. OK, so that's OK. OK, so there's no no interaction with ground there. So there's nothing connecting to ground there at all. That is absolutely fine. That's OK. We'd expect that to be the case. Just checking my multimeter is indeed in the correct mode. And it is. So there's no connection to ground there. So we'll leave that for now. So let's come around here. But essentially what would happen is, is if there was uh, continuity across one of these capacitors and it was reading continuity to ground. So let's say we check this one and the multimeter showed us uh, sort of like less than two ohms of resistance and the multimeter beeps to tell you that there's continuity across one of these caps. What I would do 
in that instance is remove this IC. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the capacitor itself is bad. In fact, these surface mount like oh, surface mount caps like these are actually very reliable, generally speaking. They don't really fail. It's more likely to be something connected to that circuit. And of course, what is connected to that circuit? Well, this. So what we would do is we would lift this charge controller IC, measure the same capacitor to see if the short is still present. If it is, we'd remove, so yes, so if it's still present after we remove this IC, then obviously the fault is somewhere else. Uh, now you could put it back on, but what I actually prefer to do at that time is leave this off. Okay, so it just removes this as being a variable completely. Okay, we can always put them back on later. So I've already, like I said, I've already troubleshooted this board before this video today. I've taken this off uh, myself. Um, I didn't relieve the short here. There was actually a short um, on one of these capacitors. It doesn't seem to be here today. Not entirely sure why that is, but anyway, it isn't here today. Um, but it was, okay? So anyway, that could have been because somebody else has had this off previously, and then maybe they've bridged a, a pin underneath here, uh, but there's no short there now. So that's absolutely fine. Okay, so we can move on. We're happy that's probably not going to be the problem then we come to this little thing here this m92t36 okay so let's take a look here m92t36 now let's just see what happens when we put our multimeter probes across some of these capacitors now again power rails are shared amongst a lot of these components okay so what happens is it's a bit like a tree branch okay and um, what happens is um, uh, yes, so what happens is it's a tree branch essentially. So you've got the big trunk, which is the main power rail. Okay, that might be 12 volts, 5 volts, 3.3, whatever. And then you've got loads of little branches coming off that one power supply, uh, power rail. Okay, so what happens is those little circuits will power other little things. So you might have a, five rail, a main 5 volt rail, for example, and then you might have a sub rail that powers the RAM. You might have a sub rail that powers the storage. You might have a power rail that powers the backlight, all that sort of stuff. Okay, but obviously a fault on any one of those uh, little um, sort of sub rails or the big rail will knock everything else out downstream of that. Potentially also knock everything else behind it as well, depending on the circuit and how it's put together. Um, so essentially, so well, let's use a Christmas analogy, Christmas tree lights. How many times have you plugged your tree lights and it doesn't do anything? And then you've got to sit there and wiggle each one in turn till they come, each light in turn till they all come back on. Well, it's a similar sort of thing. If one of these, if one of these little things fail on that line, everything on that line is potentially taken out because we have a short to ground on this machine. It means that all the voltage on that rail is going to ground rather than going through all the components it needs to do. So there you go. It's Christmas time. There you can have a Christmas analogy. Christmas tree lights. Okay. Anyway, we are, we are digressing. So anyway, this little M92T36. Let's have a probe around here and see if we have any shorts on this power rail. Okay. So multimeter is still in continuity mode. And there's nothing on that cap. But this cap... Don't know if you can hear this. I will try to get myself a little bit close to the multimeter. Okay, hopefully you can hear that when I go across both sides. Okay, I get one and a half ohms, 1.5 ohms to uh, resistance to ground and a beep. Now that means that this capacitor, rather than behaving like a capacitor, is behaving like a wire and it's allowing voltage to come out of there directly to ground. Not good, okay? So what happens is that could potentially be a problem. So we remove this IC, we see then, we measure that same capacitor and see if the short is still present. I've already removed this IC, I've checked across that capacitor and guess what? The short is still present. So we know that that is not likely to be the issue, but we'll leave the IC off until we find the fault. Okay, so then what I did is I came to suspect number three. Suspect number three, of course, if you remember, is our little AV switch. Okay, and that little AV switch there, okay, there's a big cap at the bottom of it there. You see that one? 
So we go across there. We have 1.1 ohms resistance to ground and dropping. A beep from the multimeter means we have a short across this cap. So rather than this capacitor storing charge and behaving like a capacitor, it's actually allowing, because one side's connected to ground and whatever's on the other side of this capacitor on that rail is now shorted, it's allowing power, rather than going through the circuit, just to jump directly to ground. We have a short somewhere there. So if we remove this, what happens? Well, the other day when I was troubleshooting it, this happens. So what happens is, is we are going to get our hot air wand. I have it set on 490 degrees C and airflow at 85 litres per minute. So I have it fairly well turned down. Now then, the one thing I will say is to be very careful with these boards. If you have not ever done any work on anything like this before and you're attempting this yourself, be aware that these things Ah, tiny. I'm not joking, you can barely see the bloody things. If you lose them, you will not find them again. And, well, you will need a donor to replace them. Um, yes, don't lose them. They aren't fun, okay? So we just put some flux on that IC. It's Amtec NC559V2TF, tacky flux. It's essentially a paste. What it does is it allows um, wetting and tinning of the solder. Allows it to flow, takes any oxidation and any contaminants out of the joint, gets you a nice clean solder joint. For desoldering purposes, of course, it allows the solder to flow. Makes it easier to remove that IC for us without having to put too much effort into getting it off. Okay, so I've got the fume extraction on, so it may be a little bit noisier than usual, but we'll see. Okay, so my apologies if I block you here, but I'm just coming in with the air wand. These boards are fairly thin. There's not, you know, they don't have too many layers. They're fairly small as well, so obviously, with a quality air station, it doesn't take very long at all to get these ICs to the point where they want to remove. It is very cold in this office today, though. So cold I can actually see my breath, so. Hmm. This may take a little longer than usual because obviously we've got to get the board up to temperature. Okay, I can see stuff is starting to. to want to go. And there we go. Okay. So our IC is off the board. So what happens now when we try to measure continuity <coughs> across that capacitor at the bottom there. Well, let's take a look and see. So we have one lead on one side, one lead on the other. It doesn't matter which is which. Okay, and you can hear there we have OL open line on the multimeter screen. We can't hear any beeping at all from the multimeter which means that there is no continuity anymore across this capacitor. We have relieved the short across that capacitor. Excellent. So let's go back top side of the board. Remember our little M92T36? Do you remember the capacitor that was also reading short up here earlier? This little one just there? Well, let's measure across that one again as well. Again, OL open line on the multimeter. No beep. Short has disappeared. Now then, at this point, remember, as I said before, when I looked at this board the other day, we were seeing a short here. Um, we were seeing the short, as we're still seeing the short there, and of course we were seeing the short there. Okay, so we had all three of those ICs off the board at that point. Okay, now obviously the short was still present when we relieved the M92 uh, and the charge controller IC, if you remember. 
So what I did was I left the PI3 USB off the board because obviously the short alleviated when we removed this. I put the other two chips back on in turn and after I installed each one of the two I checked those same points that were shorted before to make sure the short hadn't come back. What that does is that just makes sure that it is just this one component and not any of the other ICs that may have also gone bad. Sometimes it can take more than one, it doesn't often happen but it, it can. But that just makes sure that, that we're happy that we've got rid of the, the, the culprit. And in this particular instance it appears the culprit is this okay excellent stuff we found the problem so we need to replace it okay so some things that sort of tend to confuse uh, a few people with ICs of course is that they have to go on the board on a certain orientation okay they have a certain order they have to go on because of course they have pin one and pin one will correspond to one particular pin and everything else. You can't turn them around, you can't put them on back to front or they don't work. Now then, the way to tell them a switch which way around everything has to go is you will notice that on some of these ICs, there's a little arrow indicating here. That arrow indicates where pin one goes, okay? So pin one, the little dot on the IC will indicate pin one. That dot lines up with this arrow. So you'll see here the dot goes in this bottom corner. Uh, here the dot goes in this bottom corner. Uh, have we got any more? Down here, yeah, we have this little sort of pretty much a memory module, is it? You can see there the dot goes to this corner. Okay, and so on and so forth, and that's the same throughout the rest of the board. If we take a look here, uh, M92, arrow, dot. Okay, so if you do get confused and you remove it and you think, oh shit, I can't remember which orientation this is supposed to be in, well, there you go. So we know that little dot on our PI3 USB has to go to this bottom left hand corner. Okay, fantastic. So what we'll do is we will uh, put our new IC on there. Now remember, um, I take a look at that and I can see underneath the microscope uh, I still have some nice fillets of solder. On all these pads, they're still full of solder. Um, there's no solder that's come off with the, the old IC that I need to replace. It's, it's still got plenty of solder on there. So I don't have to top the pads up or anything like that. I can just stick the new IC in place on there, which is cool. So what we're going to do is I have a new IC right here. This is the only one I've got, so don't bloody lose it. As I say, I don't get many calls for switches. So at the minute, it's just a case of ordering in when needed. But as I say, I'm more than happy to... Uh, by the time you see this video, I'll have ordered in some some stock of some parts anyway. So as you can see there, look, we have our new chip there. That's going to go this way up. And we're just going to bob that in place there. Hopefully then, once we've done that, we'll be good to go. So, what's going to happen here is I'm just going to take it away for a second. I'm going to get some more flux in. I'm just going to pop some flux down on the board. Don't need a lot. What I'll do, I'll just sort of make sure that each of these pads has a as a covering and it does excellent now as I say because these boards are fairly small and because they're fairly thin uh, surface tension sort of is quite easy to invoke on these boards to get them to go all we need to do is make sure that's somewhere close to where we need it to be that's pretty close so I'm going to come back in now with the air wand I'm going to knock the airflow down slightly I'm going to go to 75 litres I don't want to lose this down the air chute, that would be a disaster. All I want to do is get this IC somewhere close to where its final resting place is going to be. Okay, just start off a fair old distance away. I'll do it 
trying to do this underneath the microscope is not easy. Just going to move it up. My apologies. Just need the extra space here. Could knock the airflow down a little bit further, but it's easier to leave it where it is. Okay, that's pretty close. Should be close enough. So I'm probably a good five or six centimetres above the board at the minute. What we're going to do is we're just going to watch for the flux around the chip to start to pool up. It will move. Being a little git. I've probably actually got a little bit too much flux on here. So what it's doing is, is it's floating. So what we're going to do is just keep the distance with the wand. And just let that flux start to activate. What will happen is... We will gradually get closer as we build up temperature in the board. And what will happen is you'll see the flux start to pool around the edge of the, the IC. Okay, once it stops pooling around the edge and it goes underneath, then you can start to get a little bit closer. Otherwise, that happens. If you start to get in too close too quickly, you'll skittle it. Okay. Again, I've not made life easy for myself here because there's probably slightly too much flux on this board. I've done a Lewis Rossman. I've, uh... You can never have too much flux. <laughs> Until you do. So, anyway. I'll just keep going here. Try not to make too many sudden movements with the air, with the air wand at the minute. Just keep it going. Slowly, slowly. Let's get some temperature built up. Once you've got temperature built up into the into the board, this becomes easier. Do you know what? In a minute, I'm just going to... I'll tell you what. I'm just going to remove a little bit of this. Because it's a pain in the old backside. Okay, that should be enough. That should be fine. Just going to preheat it slightly. Should make our life a little bit easier. Oops. Making hard work of this today. <laughs> Making really hard work of this today. Just stuck to the tweezers. I told you. Doing this when you're knackered is not the best idea. So if you are going to do this at home, get a good sleep in before you do. So I'm just going to go over the top of the chip. My apologies if I block this for the time being. I'm just going to try and get this somewhat set. So I'm just going around the IC currently. And then once we think we've got it roughly set in place, I'm just going to knock the airflow back up to my 85 that I added to earlier. Okay, then what I'll do is I'll just get a little more flux now it's actually in place on the board. Okay. Give it a quick brush around the edge, make sure that everything has got the coating that it needs. And let's go back in. Let's get this flowed into position. So 
So we're looking for the joints to go shiny. Okay, everything's going shiny now. Okay, excellent. And as we can see there, it's nice and centered. Just going to take this away from the scope camera for a second, just so we can see the alignment on the edge. May need a little bit of persuasion. Okay, it does just want a little bit of alignment. Okay, that's that side. I'm just going to check the other one because I think that was slightly out as well. Indeed, only ever so slightly, but you can kind of see there it's a little bit squiffy. <sighs> Okie doke, should be fine. Just gonna have a quick last check of that one, make sure we're square on all sides. They certainly appear to be, look okay there. Okay, so final thing to do. Just gonna get this back up to temperature again. And then once we're back up to temperature, we're just gonna pop a little bit of downwards pressure with the tweezer blade onto the centre of the IC. Not hard, just a little bit just to make sure everything seats. Okay, there we are. Should be good. I'm just going to have a quick check again off camera, just make sure we are seated. The pads are meeting. Well, looks okay to me. Okay, excellent. So that's our little IC replaced. Essentially, these are QFNs. There's no pads or anything on the side of the chip, so it's a little bit like doing the encoder ICs on the. Uh, on the PS4 1200s and upwards, and the retimers and redrivers on the Xbox Ones uh, with the X's and the S's. Same sort of procedure essentially, just get it in position. Give it a nudge down towards the board, make sure everything's seated properly. Because the pads are underneath the chip rather than the legs being on the side. And providing you do that. You make sure everything's seated properly and everything's good. It'll be absolutely fine. And that'll be the same here. So our IC now is replaced, it's in position. All is good. So what we'll do is we will have a look. The top side of this board, and just make sure that everything's okay around here. Because as I say, it looks a little bit um, scuffy. <laughs> Now here's a quick word of warning for you, because obviously somebody's lost um, that capacitor there previously, 
which is a bit of a problem. Um, but what I will say for you, if you are going to do this work yourself, if you do find that there is something amiss around this little IC here, this BQ24193, the little charging IC, charging controller, um, if you are going to remove that, do be very mindful of this connector here. Okay, this connector here is very, very close to the side of here. It's very easily melted. Seriously, it's bang next door to it, and it is very easy to melt these connectors and knacker them up. So there's a warning there for you that if you do remove that, what I would do if you're is I would take a little piece of captain tape, okay, that's the little copper impregnated tape, that's the sort of coppery coloured stuff, that's this stuff here, okay, it's got like an orangey tinge to it, you can just about see there, um, get some of that stuff and put it over the top of this connector, and then that way, that will help shield that connector from the heat, because like I say, it's very, very easy to actually damage this connector, this one looks just about okay, but it's easily done, so uh, you don't want to melt it. <laughs> okay, trust me, because these aren't easy to replace, they're a pain in the backside. Uh, but yes, uh, this here should be okay. Um, as I say, the charging controller I see is back over there. We'll just give that a quick clean as well, just to make sure that there's nothing to miss there. The cap that's missing by the charge controller I see, I think, is just a smoothing cap. I don't think it's doing anything particularly important. So, obviously, I'd rather it be there, but I haven't got any spares to replace it with. So when this goes back to the other place, they'll have to uh, sort that out themselves if they want it to do. But obviously, we're going to have to clean this off because it's covered in yep, all sorts of horrible crap. So we'll do that. But what we'll do now is we'll get this uh, back in the machine. We'll get it... Uh, all hooked back up to all the bits and pieces inside the chassis. Plug a charger in, see if it works. If it does charge and it does power up and it, it does look okay, then obviously we'll try and get it in the dock and we'll see if it fires up on the dock on the TV. If it does, then we know our IC is working and everything's cool. And then we'll wrap it up and call it a day. So uh, join me on the bench for testing, ladies and gentlemen. See you in a sec. Right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we have this thing largely sort of reassembled now. I've put the, the internal screws back in. Um, so the outside screws still need to go back in. But uh, yes, so what we'll do is we'll just see what happens if we connect the charger to the bottom of here. My apologies if the autofocus goes a bloody mental. May well do. Okay, let's see if we get anything on the display. I'm just going to knock the power on now. Is there anything at all? Is there anybody there? Oh. <laughs> It would help if I plugged the charger in, wouldn't it? Yes, that, that might help. I told you, you know, doing this when you're tired is not a very good idea. And there we go, look. You can see there's a little battery charging icon just there in the corner. Excellent. So obviously the battery on this is completely bugging on its backside. So what we'll probably do is give it sort of... Five ten minutes to charge up, and uh, we'll see what it does. If it if it tries to boot, uh, if it does, we'll uh, put the uh, the dock together up onto the TV, and we'll see if it uh, if it talks to the docking station. So hopefully it will, and uh, if it does, we can pop this back together completely and uh, and call it a fix. So uh, we'll give it ten minutes. I'll go do something else for for a little while, and uh, I'll come back shortly. But uh, so far, looking good. Right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, so, as you can see, we have the switch dock here. It's currently plugged in down there. 
Okay, and then the HDMI cable is plugged into the monitor. Uh, we have the switch itself here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop this in the dock and see what it does, if anything. Okay, so that's going into the dock now. And okay, so can see we have sync down there at the bottom console batteries 12 percent is the message that's just flashed up okay so the power is off at the moment so let's just try and turn it on i think i pushed it then i think did i no 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 i didn't okay so we've got a green light at the bottom and as we can see there excellent all up and running so yep that's all good so we'll get some more charge in the battery but as we can see there now we have the switch in the dock the green lit light is solid which means it's nicely connected we can see there the screen on the tv is happy that everything is good and we can be sure now that our nintendo switch is indeed working as nature intends so that's it ladies and gentlemen so what have we done there today well, we have taken this Nintendo Switch, and as you can see there on the screen, it's now working perfectly fine. When we started, of course, it had absolutely no power whatsoever. It wouldn't charge, wouldn't do anything. It was essentially a paperweight. Uh, certainly wouldn't do anything in the dock, wouldn't do anything with the charger out uh, directly into the mains or anything like that. Completely, completely screwed. So what we've actually done here today is we have gone through, we've explained some of the really basic uh, things which can cause uh, the uh, no power symptoms that you've seen there today. Uh, we actually identified a faulty uh, AV switch, the PI3 USB uh, IC as being at fault and bringing that power rail down, which uh, of course was shorting out power to the entire console. We've replaced the IC with a brand new part. We've reassembled it. We've made sure that the uh, console could receive charge. And now, as you can see, we've got it uh, to work on the display. It's just gone off now because, of course, I haven't got any Joy-Cons attached. And I, I'm not pressing any buttons. But uh, if we just knock it back on, you'll see all comes back up there. Excellent. OK, so that's it. So thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen. As always, if you've enjoyed this, then feel free to pop a comment and a big thumbs up down below. Of course, it's all, uh, it's all very helpful to me. It all helps the channel grow and everything else. Um, of course, if you're not subscribed, then take a look at the other content on the channel. I'm sure you'll find stuff on there that will uh, definitely interest you. And of course, uh, if, if you're not already, I'd really appreciate it if uh, if you did subscribe to the channel we've over 100 videos on there now um, all of various bits and pieces mostly console stuff this of course is the first switch we've done on the channel uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do a few more before we've finished so thank you for watching ladies and gentlemen um, as always if you uh, have a faulty nintendo switch yourself uh, and uh, and you want me to take a look at it and get it repaired, then of course I can do that for you. No problem at all. Uh, you can drop me an email to my business email address. That's in the description of the video. It's whiteyandrewpaul at outlook.com. Drop me an email there uh, and I will get back to you. If you can just tell me your machine, your problems that you're having, your location, I can get a quote to you anywhere in the UK or the EU. Um, that would be absolutely fine. Uh, likewise, if you need components to fix your own machines, then again, drop me an email there. We can ship components worldwide. Not a problem at all. Uh, just hit me up and tell me uh, tell me what you need. So thank you for watching. As always, ladies and gentlemen, you've been brilliant. This has been a really interesting little repair. Uh, hopefully, though, like I said, you found it useful and, uh, and you've enjoyed it. So uh, as I say, I've been Andy Paul. You've been fantastic. This switch has... Uh, has been an interesting little companion today uh, and thankfully now it's uh, it's well on the way to uh, being fully fixed and on its way back to the customer so thank you very much for watching ladies and gentlemen and i will see you shortly on the next video so for me for now it's bye bye and uh, hope life treats you well
Many thanks for watching then ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you've enjoyed this video, if you have then why not check out these recommendations below. Also, please remember to comment, rate and of course subscribe to the channel if you found this useful. We have plenty more content on there and there's lots more to come.